this morning we're going to continue on in our study in the book of Acts. And this morning we're going to look at a passage that's going to push in on us, especially with uh, the idols that we have in our lives, uh, which, you know, for most of us, if not all of us, we may say, oh, you know, I don't have any idols in my life. But I think as we walk through this, this message this morning, we'll be challenged to realize that maybe our worship of God is not as focused or centered as it should be. But today we are in Acts chapter 17, uh, verses 16 through 34. Uh, feel free to turn there your Bibles, pull up your smartphones. You can use the pew Bibles in front of you as well, or just follow along in the screen. But so far we've been, of course, reading through the book of Acts ever since the, back in April, right after Easter. And uh, what we've noticed so far in this story, in this book of Acts, is that as we've noticed the rise of the Christian church, the Christian faith, uh, the rise of the gospel. In just a, a few short months, we've found that Christianity has spread from about only 120 followers of Jesus to, to thousands of people. Thousands of people, and it's all because it's centered on this message of Jesus the Messiah dying and being resurrected, coming back from the dead. Again, these people experienced him coming back from the dead, and they wanted to share that with everyone. Again, when you witness that and when you experience that, it's kind of hard to keep your mouth shut, right? Uh, and so they shared these things, these firsthand accounts these, uh, of Jesus being coming back from the dead. And this is what was the ignition uh, at least on our own power. Again, the Holy Spirit did a lot too, but that was the ignition that st- started, helped this Christianity to spread from the small group to thousands and thousands over just a few months' time. And uh, just a, a couple weeks ago, we were introduced to this significant church uh, in the city of, of Antioch. And this church was significant for several different reasons, but one is that it was very much a, a missions-minded church, ascending-minding church. Uh, you know, they sent out two missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, and these missionaries, they went out, they trained up other leaders, they, they started other churches, and they ended up spreading all these churches all throughout the known world. And in our passage this morning, the second half of chapter 17, it's a continuation of Paul's missionary journey. And in chapter 17, he enters this great city of Athens. And what happens is in Athens is a huge moment in church history is he comes into the city, he brings the gospel in, and it, it challenges their, their notions of who really is the true God. And so before we dig into our passage this morning, I want to share the big idea today. And the big idea is this, is that we are called to exchange whatever we are worshiping for the worship of a God who loves us. We are called to exchange whatever we are worshiping for the worship of a God who loves us. So let's dive in. We're going to get started by reading through the first couple verses of this passage, 16 through 21, just to get us started. So it says, while Paul was waiting for them, which were his missionary companions in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And then they took him and brought him to a meeting in the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. And all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. So Paul is in this great city of Athens, and which we believe he probably has never, ever been there before. In the first century A.D., Athens it didn't have the political influence that it did in the past, but still was very much an intellectual and religious center of the Roman world. Again, the, the Romans, they loved power. In the first century B.C., they began to have also a love affair with the Greek city of Athens. And so many Romans populated the city. And so the city is full of Romans, it's full of Greek people. And the Greeks, they loved knowledge and intellect and thought 
And Athens was a center of all of these things. You know, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Athens was home to all these great Greek thinkers. And Athens was a place for the latest and the greatest philosophies. And so Paul, he enters into the city and he waits for his, um, his companions. He waits for Silas and Timothy to show up. And perhaps he's probably doing maybe a little bit of sightseeing into the city. And he's struck by the environment because everywhere that you look is idols, idols, idols. You know, Athens was uh, the city that was best known for what we would call idolatry. You know, they had the best of the sculptors and architects lived in Athens. You had the finest altars, you had the finest sculptures, and you had the greatest architectural temples all dedicated to the gods. Again, it was full of idols, it says in our text this morning. This phrase in Greek literally means to drown, to drown. And so in other words, the city is drowning in its idolatry. You know, Aphrodite, Zeus, Hermes, Apollos, and all those other ones that they represent, they were everywhere in the city. A god for every pleasure and vice. You know, maybe a, a modern day equivalent, again, we've probably heard this before, would be maybe something like Las Vegas uh, here today. But again, Paul sees what is around him and he's, he's, he's grieved by it. His heart aches. Why? Because he sees people being led astray from the true God. And so my question for us this morning is, how do you respond to the idolatry that you see in our own community here in Shippensburg? Well, the first thing is that we need to do is we need, is we need to recognize it. You have to see it for what it is. Now, say if we're in some other part of the world, it, let's say, you know, India, that would be easy to kind of see those things because there are idols that are all scattered throughout that country. You know, I've read that in parts of India, there's literally a, a figurine on every street corner because in Hinduism, there are over 330 million gods. In fact, you can go online, you can buy some of those little statues and figurines too. Again, idolatry is everywhere there. It's, it's obvious. But we here in the West, here in America, we see ourselves as being maybe more enlightened than those folks. Again, I don't think many of us would be caught, uh, you know, bowing down to some little man-made figurine and giving it our total allegiance. But again, what really is an idol? I heard once said, if you want to know the real idols of your city, find out what the tallest buildings are. And that could be the one indicator of what the idols in your city are. But the center of idolatry is actually your heart. See, idolatry is the worship of, of something. And since we are created by God to, to worship, we are all prone to elevate and create idols in our lives. An idol is anything that captures your heart more than God. Therefore, even good things that we have in our lives can become idols if we elevate it to the place of supremacy in our lives. So Paul, you know, he does more than just look around and see the idolatry here in this passage. The word see here in the Greek is actually not a, a common word that we would see mentioned in the Bible a lot for the word see. It's actually the Greek word uh, theramatai, from where we get our English word theory. So what he s does is he sees and he begins to theorize. Now when you form a theory, again, you're, what you're doing is you're gathering information, you're collecting the data, uh, you're thinking critically, and, and Paul is basically asking the question, uh, how? In light of all that I see, how can I reach these people with the gospel? He's beginning to think in light of what he sees and how he can break through this and present Jesus, present the, the true God, the true faith, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so as is custom, he begins in the synagogue, and of course Paul was a Jew. He would have had a, a welcome mat to most synagogues, and so he goes in there and he's handed portions of scriptures that would correspond to the prophets that spoke about the coming Messiah uh, texts like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and Micah 5. He 
you'll be all over the place and be saying, again, you see all these prophecies? I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the one that fulfilled all of them. So he'd go into the synagogues and he would reason and explain that Jesus is the Messiah. And then from there, we see that he goes into the, the marketplace. You know, he goes into the marketplace and he's applying his theory. The Greek word uh, for marketplace is the agora. And the agora in Athens was the, the heartbeat of the city. It was a seat of politics. You, brought, you, sorry, you bought and sold there. The public courts were held there. It was the, the heartbeat of life. It was also the place where people would come and share their new influential ideas. In fact, a man would stand and he would, they would say he would herald or make proclamation. You know, here is a new thought. Here is a new philosophy. Uh, and all that took place in the Agora. And we hear that word herald a lot of times. Again, even a lot of our, our newspapers are called uh, heralds in there. Again, it was all the way back to the Agora. And so Paul, he enters into this space, this agora, and he begins to preach Jesus in the resurrection. And these critical thinkers, they begin to listen. And Paul continues to speak. You know, there's a lot of Christians in our world today that believe that we should be retreating from the world around us. Retreating from it, again, that's, that's a bad idea. We're called to reach it, not run from it. Some, uh, some Christians believe that the faith should be just private, just to myself, not something that the public should know about. But again, that's impossible in the world that we live in because if you're going to have any kind of faith in the gospel, uh, you will eventually hit that wall of the world, or the culture around you. you know, for example, we, we look back to the Old Testament of Daniel. In Daniel, he serves this pagan king, so well because of his character. He ra- rises the ranks and becomes one of the king's favored men. And then a law is passed that no one should worship or pray to anyone except to the king. And Daniel, of course, he has this, this habit of prayer that he prays regularly to God. And now this is against the law. You know, Daniel, he's like, you know, I'm okay with any law uh, as long as it doesn't, you know, go against the law of God. But when man's law surpasses God's law, no deal. So what does Daniel do? He prays to his God, and he gets caught for doing it. Through his, this experience, it's, it's difficult for Daniel. It's not easy. But through his experience, Daniel's God, sorry, Daniel's God is put on display for who he really is. So for one to say, you know, I just have a, a, a private faith, not a public one, That's to say, eventually, you will be influenced by the world yourself. And as Christians, we are not to be influenced by the world, but we are to to transform the world. Our faith is both private and also public. And the question we need to ask ourselves is how? How do we engage the world in a way that changes it? And that's a good question. Again, we're, we tend to always ask the how question, don't we? You know, how do I get a good job? How do I build a good career? How do I find a spouse? You know, what's interesting about the Bible is that you'll never find the step one, two, and three in those regards. You'll never find those clear, easy, easy, easy clear steps. You don't find them in the Bible. When you ask the how question, you are not going to find that in there. But instead, you find out that you need to concentrate on your character. It's not a three-step process. It's about your character. In other words, how do I find a godly spouse? Concentrate on being the kind of person that you want to be married to. How do I build a career for myself? The, The Bible says be faithful in the little things. Over time, you'll become irreplaceable, indispensable. And you know what? You'll look back and you realize that the career has come. But not because I've applied this step and then this step, but simply because I'm trying to pattern my life after Jesus. So again, in this text today, Paul's heart is moved. He speaks, and there's this movement that begins to take place around him as he takes his faith 
public. Of course, not everybody responds in the same way. In Paul's crowd, there are people called the Epicureans. And the Epicureans, they had this motto of uh, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. So basically, it was live for day, today, live for the flesh, and you die and be buried in the ground, and that's it. There's nothing after this life. If you have to take advantage of the people in the world, that's, that's fine. Who cares? What does it matter? Again, they're going to die too. There's no consequences. There's no repercussions on how you live your life. Again, all you have is this life, so live it any way that you want to. Find pleasure in it. Meanwhile, you have the, the Stoic philosophers too, and they, they were the direct opposite of the Epicureans. And you had to live your life with honor, dignity, and respect. And so Paul, he's introducing to these people this, this new idea. Some say, what is this babbler talking about? Others say that he seems to be sharing about foreign gods and they want to know more about it. Again, specifically, he's talking about Jesus and that he came back from the dead. And again, this info was new here in Athens, but again, it was something, something that was certainly worth hearing for them. And so then Paul is taken from the Agora to, to the Oropagus. And so the Oropagus is also known as Mars Hill. Again, probably a lot of us have been heard that term before by the Romans. And this is a, a picture of what that place looks like today. This is a place where the most influential people or influential thinkers in Athens would gather. There's actually a council of men who would judge the fit to consider whether an idea was worthy or not of listening to. And so Paul, he gets brought to this council. And so now, or the rest of our passage this morning, he begins to share this message about Jesus. And so we're now turning on over to verse 22. It says, then Paul then stood up in the meeting of, of the Oropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. So again, this is a, a great start for Paul. Again, he's being very respectful. You know, one of the number one rules for, for sharing with, with anyone is to be respectful, to know your audience. Uh, again, he uh, doesn't say, you know, turn to, you know, this place in your Bible. Again, this is a, a crowd of people, these Greek and Romans folks that have no idea who the Hebrew God is. They have no idea that the Hebrews even have their own scriptures. And so he begins his message where the listener is at. And then he says this in verse 23. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are very, so you are ignorant to the very things you worship. And that is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So the Greeks, again, they have all these, these altars which on sacrifices were made in order to appease their gods. And again, remember, if you know anything about Greek mythology, these gods are, were distant type gods. They kind of messed with humans just for their own amusement, but they had really no interest in them whatsoever. Meanwhile, they, were, they would actually punish humans if they were not being served. So they had all these altars in order to sacrifice so that people wouldn't be punished for them. And then they also have this, this altar to this unknown God. And Paul goes on to say that I'm going to tell you about this God that you do not know. He says this in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. So right away, Paul, he goes big and goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 to share about this God to them. And Paul basically goes on to, to them and say, hey, everybody, look all around you. Look all around you. Look at the nature around you. Do you see the, the order and the design? Do you see the incredible complexity of everything? This unknown God that you worship, he did all this. God created all of that. God created the world, the stars, and the heavens. He created the universe. And then Paul goes on to say this God, 
that you don't know is too big to fit in anything made by human hands because he stands outside of his own creation. He stands outside of time. No, he's way too big to fit in anything that you would make by your hands. And he goes on to say this in verse 25. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather he gives, he, sorry, rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. A little bit of a historical context here. Uh, in about 600 BC, Athens was hit with a, a plague. And a, a lot of people died in this plague. And this one guy named Epimenides, if I can say it right, Epimenides, had this idea. He said, clearly, this is happening because the gods are upset with us, so we need to make the right sacrifices to our gods. So they're going to release, this is a real thing that happened, release all these sheep into the city. And uh, wherever a particular sheep would lay down, they would make a sacrifice to the nearest gods at that temple. So again, that's what they did. And they released the sheep, and they're wandering around. You know, one lays down next to the temple of the Apollos, and then they make a sacrifice to that god. And, but what happened was that some of these sheep, they would walk around, they would uh, keep walking around to these weird parts of the city. They would actually even leave the city itself, and they would lay down. And the people, they didn't know what to do at all. So again, we don't have a temple by these sheep. So what are we going to do? Well, they, they created a temple to this unknown God at this moment. And so when you come to the first century AD, this is exactly what they're talking about. You know, they're basically saying, you know, we don't want another plague to come to us, so we're going to make a sacrifice to this unknown God just to, to cover up our bases so nothing bad happens to us. But this unknown God, this true God, Paul goes on to say that he cannot be served by human hands like he needs you. You see, you have all these sculptures and all these Greek gods, and these things have to be maintained. If you leave Zeus out in the cold for too long, that stone is going to, and carving is going to decay. It's going to get mold. You're going to need to refresh it all the time. Paul goes on to say that this God is the one that gives everything to us, gives us breath, and life, he gives you everything. He gives you life, he gives you the air that you breathe, and that's the God that Paul is talking about here. Move on to verse 26. It says, From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So not only did this God create all of humans, He's involved with them personally. Again, this language is very personal. This is a direct opposite of what the Greeks believed about their gods as distant gods. This is a God who's all personal to us. Verse 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So again, Paul, he's, he's starting to turn the corner here. Again, there's a God. He created everything. He can't be served by human hands. He's way too big for that. And he can be known. He's very, very close to us. And then what Paul does here in the next verse is he starts to quote some of their own Greek philosophers. It says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So he quotes two Greek poets that were well known to the people at the time. He does that because there's words reflected truth, and at the same time, he's building a bridge to his audience. And now, Paul takes their words and applies it to the true God. He says this in verse 29. It says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In other words, what Paul is telling this people right here is that you are going to have to radically change your thinking on who God is. Again, you've had this mindset, this, this perspective of what gods are supposed to be like and who they are. 
No, you need to change your mindset of who the real, true God is. And then verse 30 says, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So again, Paul, he continues to press in. And he says, you see, you didn't know this stuff before, but now you know it. You were ignorant, but now you're no longer ignorant. You're going to be held accountable. So he's, he's been saying so far that there is a God. He's big. He created everything. He, give, he gives humans, he gives man breath, he gives them life. And now he wants us to repent, to turn the corner, to turn our direction to him. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 31 how he knows this to be true. He says, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof to everything by raising him from the dead. So Paul says that you all have your your Greek mythology. You have your, your beautiful fantasies, you have your statues, you have your temples. But let me tell you about the God that you don't know. Again, he is real. He's bigger than you know. He's closer than you can imagine. And he's asking you to change your thinking about him and the way that you live your life because there is a judgment day that's coming because this God is holy and righteous and he can't turn a blind eye to the wrongs and sins of our world. Yet unlike your gods, this God is just. And there will be a judgment day. I know this to be true because he raised someone from the grave. You know, one of the harshest things about all the wrongs that we do in our lives is that our sin keeps us in the grave. It's, it's death. The wages of sin is death. But it says here, so if God raised a man to life, that, that God has the power to give life over death to those who he wants to. And so Paul, he roots his entire message Again, in the resurrection, this historical fact that happened that God raised Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, from the dead. So Paul is saying that the resurrection is the basis for everything that I tell you. And this, this passage closes, these last couple verses here, with the, kind of the results of Paul's message. It says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council, and some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Uh, among them was Dionysus, a member of the Eropagus, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. Now, when we read through these couple verses, that uh, those results may seem kind of small to us. Again, two names Luke actually gives us, but also maybe others responded to. Other people, they mocked Paul for his beliefs. But no matter what, Paul was faithful in acting on his heart for the lost people of Athens. He was moved with compassion because he see, saw those idols everywhere and he knew that judgment was coming. He had to share that good news with them. So this morning, you may be thinking, what does this really have to do with me? Well, it's everything. Because the, the root problem of our life is idolatry. You know, so the question for us this morning, what is your idol? Now, honestly, it's probably, it's a good thing that you've turned into the greatest thing in your life. You know, for me, I, I love my kids, Isaac and Evie. Evie just turned 10 months old on Friday. And uh, again, but I love them, but they make super lousy gods. <laughs> uh, you know why? My, first of all, my kids are super, super needy. <laughs> Uh, again, they're never satisfied, and they're just, they're kind of fickle, just like I am. You know, I also, I love my wife, Amanda, but she was not made, uh, she was not created to give me everything that I need. They were never meant to be objects of worship, because everybody worships something. So how do you know what that is for you? So here's the question I have for you this morning. The question is, what is it in my life if I no longer had that thing, that person, that identity, if I no longer had it, my life would no longer be worth living. 
And whatever the answer to that question is, you've just exposed your heart's greatest love. So what happens is that the, the gospel itself it invites you to make this exchange. You exchange what was never meant to be a God for what was meant to be truly worshipped. The God who created you, who sent his son to die for you, who came back from the dead. Again, there will be a day of judgment. Again, if you believe in Jesus and place your faith in him, you correct all the wrongs that are done in your life. He corrects all that. Again, we need to remember that we are born into a dysfunctional relationship with our creator God. We can't deny that. We all do stuff that's messed up, that's broken. And Jesus, he came to make all that right. So that's why we need to worship Jesus instead of our our spouse or our family members, maybe even some identity that we might have in our lives. You know, identity is the thing that's in our world today. Identity comes in so many different shapes and sizes. And there's there's sexual identity, there's gender identity, there's a career identity, you name it. Everything has got this identity label that's on it because we all want to be somebody. But guess what? You're already somebody. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross for you. And you are somebody because God loves you. God sees you as your son and da- or daughter. God created you with a purpose. God created you intently. He created you every little aspect about you. God loves you. And so you are already somebody. And so when you make that exchange in your life, stop worshiping the, the false gods that we have to worship the true God, the good things that are in your life that you were never meant to worship and you actually end up enjoying those things because you're not enslaved to them. They find their their proper place in your life. You can actually really enjoy your spouse. You can enjoy your kids or your grandkids. They're going to let you down. That's okay. You have something else that you worship that won't let you down. So those things actually have a, a greater enjoyment in your life because they don't master you anymore. They're not, you're not a slave to them anymore. So again, you are freed up to love them even more, and you are freed up to love them in the way that you are loved by God because God has already created you as someone special, someone worth loving, and someone worth the love God back. Would you join me in prayer? And Father, this is a a passage of scripture that presses in on every single one of us, me included. So God, in this moment, I just want to confess you, my own idolatry, the idols that I am just drawn to. Those idols that rob me of my life. That they don't give me life, they rob me of my life. And God, I also pray that for each one of us here, that you would help us to confess our own idols as well the idols that rob us of the life that you desire for us, those idols that master us, that make us slaves to them. And God, that you just free that, free us of those things in order for us to to worship you, but also put those things in a proper place so that we can enjoy them, God. To God, we ask today that you give us a clear picture of the cross, a clear, clear picture of the love of Jesus. Give us a clear picture of who you are as author, creator, and sustainer of the world. Help us to love you more and everything else less. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.